All right. Sort of title this, Where Do You Begin? Where do you start rebuilding amidst all the rubble? Nehemiah chapter 3 is, is the start. As they began to rebuild the wall, we're going to talk about uh, the rebuilding of the walls. Now, we actually get to talk about the rebuilding. Finally, as you go through Nehemiah, and we're in chapter 3 now, uh, we're going to focus on the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, coming especially in the next month. Now, this book, Nehemiah describes the utter devastation. It just sort of briefly describes it, but it's enough for you to get the idea that if you looked out on the city of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, all you saw was trash, rubbish, and uh, heaps and piles. Look in, I said chapter 3, but look at chapter 4 and verse 2. And this is a description of what it looked like when you looked in the city. And start in verse 1, But it came to pass that when Sanballat, who was one of the enemies, who was one of the guys who did not want Nehemiah there, did not want the rebuilding, he's kind of a, an example of what the devil is like. When Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth, which is an old word for full of wrath. And he took, and, and took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews, and he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria, and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day, an end of, of their dominion, of the Sanballat's dominion? Are you going to cut us off in the day and start your own country again? Will they revive the stones out of the, here's the key, keywords, out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned. So we're, when I show you these pictures and I give you illustrations like that one, I'm showing you sort of what it looked like when you just looked out on this city. Heaps and piles of rubbish. Um, and um, last week I told you that um, it was the result of their sin. This was not a natural disaster like an earthquake, and I've seen earthquakes over there. I think one of the bigger ones I remember was uh, in, in Iran there like five or six years ago, and maybe a little bit more, and 50,000 people were killed in one earthquake in Iran. I don't know if you remember that or not, but it was just utter devastation. But this did not occur because of an earthquake, because of a tornado or a hurricane. This, this was God's judgment. God brought a foreign kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar and all the armies, and they, just like a hoover, just uh, sucked everything out of, out of place and destroyed Jerusalem. Left no stone standing upon another. So we're looking back uh, about 445 years before the birth of Christ. And that's 2,462 years ago, if you want to be very exact. And when you hear of a wall three kilometers long, 15 feet thick, that have been broken through and thrown down and piled in a hu he huge heaps of stones. Sounds like, sound like, so what? That's so far removed from us. But this book is about rebuilding things. This book in your Bible is not for history only, even though it's a historical event. It's about fixing things and about mending things, about repairing things and restoring things. I'll give you a little secret, uh, uh, not just a secret, but a little thing I really enjoyed. I was, I was um, reading in, in Matthew, and it says that when Jesus went by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers who were doing something there on the, uh, on the side of uh, the lake. They had just come in from the day, and you know what they were doing with their nets? They were mending their nets, and that spoke to me. He says, it's a constant effort, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're working and doing something, you have to keep things going, you have to mend it. But I thought, Jesus saw two men who were not negligent, say, ah, we'll leave it for tomorrow. Ah, this is not a big deal. Ah, sure, we can get a few more uses out of this net before we have to go buy a new one. No, they said, I'm going to keep this net. And I, want to, I want to mend it. And Jesus said, I can use you guys because I need you to go mend some, some cities and some lives and some homes and some marriages. So this book... Nehemiah and Ezra is the same, are about rebuilding things. Because it's needed today, folks. Uh, marriages are broken. Would you agree? I think, I know if I asked you right now, were your parents happy being married? Half of you would say, probably not. If you were honest. 
marriage for the last, I don't know how long, has been broken. God didn't design it to be a torture, amen? Some of you men are going, do you hear that, honey? <laughs> <laughs> marriage in the modern age, that's why there was such a push at the same-sex referendum to get their new definition of marriage in because they looked around and went, it's not working. Minds are broken. Too many people, especially Christians, are unable to sleep. They're unable to forgive. They're unable to think through their problems. Their minds are broken. Trust is broken. Nobody trusts anybody. No one, no one wants to earn trust. Nobody wants to take responsibility. They always blame. You, just, you stop somebody and you say, hey, don't do that. What are you talking about? It's not my fault. No. Nobody wants to just say, yeah, sorry. People's trust is broken. Hearts are broken. I know Christians who haven't been happy for years. I mean, they're just stuck. Well, if I could just do this. Well, if I just had that. And so they live in misery. That's a broken life, man. People's faith is broken. You go out there and you talk to people about the Lord, most everybody's saying, I don't believe in God anymore. Their faith is broken. You know, they've been trusting in themselves and in religious icons and priests and trusting in their prayers, trusting in fairies, trusting in angels, and trusting in bitcoins. And they're constantly let down. And we're looking at a society that is broken. If you haven't figured it out that our society is broken, I can't help you because when a society believes that abortion is a good thing, when a society says you have a problem pregnancy, kill the baby, Society is broken. When society says marriage isn't working, let's introduce more problems into it by making same sex also valid as a marriage. You got society broken. So, but the worst of all, the worst of all, Brother Dan, is most Christians, or no, let's just let's, most people have not built one spiritual thing in their life ever. They've never read their Bible through. They they go to church just barely. Uh, if at all, there's, there's no desire to even build something that will last. That's the grief. So you look out on, on, on society and you see a wasteland, you see desolation, you see nobody even trying to build. So, now, since, since the very first Sunday in January, we've worked verse by verse through the book of Nehemiah. And we've, uh, uh, we've, we've, came and we just came to the approach of chapter 3 where we learned about overcoming discouragement. The one thing that'll keep you, besides the devil, the thing that'll keep you from starting and rebuilding what's broken in your home and in your life and in your mind and in your past and in your future, the thing that'll keep you from trying is discouragement from failure in the past. So we talked about that last week. This week in chapter 3, God shows us where we're going to start the work. Where does it begin and who needs to start it? So let's pray. Father, I ask you to help us hear your word this morning. Take it seriously. Don't let it just fall on deaf ears. Don't let it just fall on hard wayside ground. God, let it be good ground this morning. I pray against confusion and, and whatever the devil would throw into the mix, let it just be clear and helpful this morning. And I pray that you give us revival, please. However you would deem fit, please revive your people for the work. In Jesus' name, amen. So, where do we start the work? Exactly who starts it? So, look at chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm going to read this verse because that's all we're going to need this morning. And there are two great points in here, and we're done. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it. They set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it, and unto the tower of Hananiel. Now, the, uh, the work was started by a guy named Eliashib. Now, Eliashib, who is this guy? Now, we get a glimpse of him. That there's only a few other dimensions of this guy. But he leaves a huge impact if you'll, if you'll take a moment and think about it. Because his name means God will restore. Now that's cool. Now how did mommy and daddy, the parents of Eliashib, look down at their baby and go, he looks like a Joe. 
But let's call him lionship. <laughs> How'd they decide that? And yet God, behind that thing, uh, took a man who was the high priest, we're talking about what that meant here in a moment, and said, I can use a man whose name means God can fix anything. So, God will restore. So that's his name. Now, he was the high priest of Israel. What does that mean? Well, that means he was a descendant of Aaron. That was a thousand years earlier. And in that family, there was a, a, a uh, um, the, the head of the family and the firstborn son of, of Aaron and the firstborn son of that son. Da, 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 da. We're going through. It would always be the high priest in Israel. Now, what that meant was that he did some amazing things as the high priest. The first thing he did was he was a mediator. Now, how many of you ever been in between two people arguing, wanting to kill each other, and you wanted just to walk away, you know, and just let them at it? But a mediator says, hold on, no, wait a minute, no, no, listen to their side. Now, hold on, no. You see, a mediator is, is, a, is a good friend that, you, that everybody is good to have. But a mediator between us and God is invaluable because it's amazing that somebody could bring sinful us close to a holy God and bring us together. That's what the high priest's job was. He was a mediator between God and men. He prayed for them constantly. He actually carried a beautiful uh, piece on his, on his chest that had 12 stones that reminded him of the 12 tribes of Israel that he would constantly pray for them and hold back the judgment of God against them. Often he would discern the will of God. When, when the nation of Israel was trying to decide, do we do this or do we do that? Do we go for a king? Do we not go for a king? They would go to the high priest, and he had a little pouch with two stones, and uh, they were called the Urim and the Thummim, and he would decide and discern what was God's will for the nation. He worshipped God continually. And you would expect that of this guy. He was a high priest. He's, when everybody else was busy buying, selling, um, uh, sleeping. They were, this guy's life was consumed with worship. That's what his job was. It was a 24-7 job. There was never a moment that he'd stopped being the high priest. He didn't only do a 9-to-5 job and then take off his priestly garments and then just go and sit with a beer with the boys. He was 24-7. He was the high priest. When he woke up, God was on his mind. Throughout all day long, he was lifting up names of people, um, uh, leaders, and servants, and helpers, and, 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 and everybody in the kingdom. He was constantly worshiping God. This was the job. But the most important thing he did was he offered the sin offering for all the people every year. Only he was allowed to take the blood of an innocent lamb on the Day of Atonement and to walk into the holy of holiest places in the tabernacle and to sprinkle it on the mercy seat, obtaining forgiveness for all the people. It was a very, very big job. Now, but this day, and look at that first word in chapter 3, verse 1. Then, Eliashib, the high priest, he rose up in his brethren and priests, and they did what? They built it. So this day, and until all the walls and the gates of this city were finished, Eliashib was a worker amidst the ruins. I mean, now that's cool. I, I can, I can, here's this guy who has a very powerful position, a very uh, posh position, a very well-respected position, and there he was taking those royal robes off, and there he was taking off those fancy sandals, and he's putting on his work clothes there, and he put his back into the work. That encourages me. I like helpers. I don't like supervisors, amen? How many of you have ever had a supervisor who just said, now go do this and do that, and they're sipping their cup of tea like Eric? <laughs> I got to go get another cup of tea. Make sure that block is moved. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was a worker, and he was a worker in the midst of the ruin. He didn't look down on it. He didn't go, oh, could you make sure that's cleaned up? No, he got down there and got his own hands dirty. He actually lived in that very city. And this is rare in leaders. Most preachers, most people in religion live above the people. They live on the people. They take advantage of people. They manipulate their message to get more out of the people. Am I talking clear? Most religion 
He is ultimately hated by the people because they see nothing but users at the top who live above them and never lift their finger one day, just like the Pharisees. Jesus would go to the Pharisees and says, you, you lay heavy and grievous burdens on people, and yet you yourself will not lift one finger. He was furious at them. Amen. So all these prosperity preachers with the 10 rings on their fingers, they've got private jets, five mansions spread all over the world, and they say, God is asking you to give more. It's an abomination to God. Amen, amen, amen. Here's a high priest who got down and he worked. And he got dirty and he worked. Right amidst all that ruin. Amen. Secondly, he was a living example. He showed, he showed, now notice, when it says then Eliashib, I can just see Eliashib in the midst of the people and he just bolts up and he just says, come on guys, and he just starts working. And by that, he begins to show them, this is what we need to be doing. He acts first. Now, I'm going somewhere with this because this is helpful for you and me. Is says, how do I get started? I got a problem between me and my, my son. I got a problem between me and my daughter. I got a problem between me and my husband or me and my wife. I got a problem between me and my preacher. I got a problem between me and my boss. I got a problem in my heart. Where do I begin? That's where we're going in this thing. Because you can't begin. He picked up. All that rubbish. He carried it hundreds of meters away outside the, the city of Jerusalem to a nearby river and dumped them there. And he carefully began setting all those massive stones that were all in rubble back in place, sealing them with the mortar. And it was just being an example of do as I do instead of do as I say. You know why younger brothers and sisters don't like the older brother and sister telling them what to do? Because we know they're not going to do what they're telling us to do. He was a finisher of what he was starting. And I like that. By chapter 7, the whole wall is finished. So whatever Eliashib starts, he works the longest, but he makes sure he finishes. And I like that. I like that. But let me, let me bring up a thought here. Eliashib initiated a labor. Nehemiah didn't raise a, one of those fake guns and say, On your marks, get set. Okay, everybody, grab a trowel, grab your shovels, go. No. God knew there needed to be somebody who would step up and would take the lead and be the example and initiate the work. Because I can command all day what you should do. It's awesome when somebody says, all right, I'll get started. You need that. Every congregation is dead unless somebody says, amen. He's right, and I'm going to do that. Amen. Every church congregation is dead on arrival until somebody says, I'll get busy. Amen. So if you just came this morning so that I can just fill your cup, whether with tea or with coffee or with preaching, until you finally say, I got to get moving. Now, you may be fearful or whatever, but it's really nice when somebody just, you just the, the, the preaching and the word of God just gets to them and they just get busy. I'll tell you a, a, a little example of when um, two times in my life, and I'm not the greatest initiator. Don't, don't try to uh, figure this out because when I got saved on the 15th of June, 1980, it was after the pastor preached and preached and preached on unsaved church members and tares among the wheat and uh, people living a lie and people going to hell because they won't, they won't believe what Jesus did for them and they just, they just, they keep putting it off and so on. And I knew he was preaching about me, but I wouldn't. I mean, it, it, he gave an invitation. He said, come up and talk to me. Take my hand. I'll pray with you. If you need to get saved, come on. I'll, I'll answer your questions. And nobody moved until one young lady did. And she was one of the deacon's daughters. Um, I would say at that time, I was 17. I think she was 16. And she went forward and just started to cry and bold and said, I've been living a lie. I have been... A, a, a good little girl for mommy and daddy. I go to this church, but I've never, ever, ever gotten saved because I was wanting to live my own life. I was wanting to hope that I would get saved later and I'll just live my way. I'll, I'll have my fun and then I'll get saved. But that night she says, I'm a fool. And I'm watching her. I'm like, oh, I should do that. 
And the pastor asked one more time, he says, who else would like to get saved this, this evening? And I went, no, don't push. He went, okay, amen. And I mean, wow. Now, right after that, I went up to my youth director, John Cramper, and I says, we need to talk because I don't want to go to hell. And he led me to Christ later on that evening. But that young lady making that move like a dagger to my heart, I should have been able to follow. Wasn't that God's gift to a wretch like me? I'll give you another one. A couple weeks later, we had a missions conference where there were missionaries speaking every night. And by Wednesday night, nobody had moved. Nobody had responded to the call to, to be a missionary, call to serve God with all your life. On Wednesday night, I just, I just remember the pressure, just the call of God was like, who will go? Who will go? And I'm like, mm, I don't know. I, I'm not qualified. I'm just, I'm just brand new Christian. I don't even know what's out there. What is out there? I'm a Texan. I, I, all I live is for Texas. And then a, a guy named Ryan McCarthy got up out of his seat. He went up to the pastor and he said, I believe God's called me to be a missionary. And I said, I'm not missing this. <laughs> and I got to, I think God's called me to be a missionary too. <laughs> now, I don't fully understand what all that was doing. I'm just telling you that sometimes when somebody does make the move, it helps the rest of us to get moving. And when you're sitting there arguing with God, believe me, so are 15 other people. It'd be nice if one of you stop arguing. <laughs> and just get busy, Amen. I want a church that doesn't just say amen, but says, let's get busy. Let's not wait. Because Eliashib started. He initiated this thing. He took the lead. He didn't wait for anybody else. He was first to jump up. Start. He picked up that rubble, started rebuilding. He rose up. I like it says, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up, man. He got off his rear. He got out of his comfort zone. And he got moving. Came a good example. Motivated everybody to get busy. It's a great encouragement to watch. <laughs> I think he made great sacrifices when he did that. One, he sacrificed his position because he stepped down to that of a servant. And then he sacrificed his time. I believe he was already busy as the, the high priest. I don't think he was allowed to stop being the high priest. I believe he really had to squeeze in to his schedule, time for work. See, some of us are really bad habiters. You know what that means? Well, I'm too busy. And you know, the point is this. If you're too busy to read your Bible, too busy to be in church, too busy to go soul winning, then what's the truth? You're too busy. you got to squeeze it in. Every one of you say, Pastor, it must be easy for you to go soul winning. You have no idea. Pastor, it must be easy for you to pray. You, you probably pray all day. I wish I could. Oh, Pastor, you, you read 400 chapters a day, right? No, I wish I could. But you know what I do? I squeeze everything that I know I should do into my schedule because I know I should. And so did he. He didn't stop being the high priest. He just added more work. And that's what Christianity is. Christianity is not... Well, I think, well, pastor, I'm kind of tired of working on the assembly line. Pastor, I'm kind of tired of, of paying the bills. Pastor, I'm tired of, of, uh, of uh, you know, all of the tr uh, travel to work and home. And I said, I think I'll be a preacher and relax. You know, if you ever want to preach, you ever want to uh, serve the Lord, you ever want to be a Sunday school teacher, you've got to work. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to be there for, for wife and kids. You got to uh, uh, do all of those things, and you now add more work to your schedule. Amen. You don't stop. So Eliashib, he's a good example. He sacrificed the time. As you can tell, I like him. I like Eliashib. I'll tell you why. Because he's a starter, and he got everybody started, and he's a finisher. Amen. But it goes on even from there. The work of Eliashib, the high priest, pointed to the future Messiah, which is really the best part of this whole message here. You see, in other words, Eliashib was a shadow, a type, a preview of who Jesus would be when he comes 440 years later. You know, the Bible's full of people who give you a glimpse ahead of time of who Jesus would be like. You read in there and you see Adam and how he chose to die with his wife instead of live separate and let her die alone. No, 
when he made that decision, he chose his wife. Now, ah, it, it plunged us all into sin, but the second Adam died for us, his new wife. When, um, uh, when you look through the Bible and you see all of those people as, fla as flawed as they were and as messed up as they are, a lot of them are a good example of what Jesus was going to become. Nehemiah is one of them. Daniel's one of them. King David's one of them. You find David worshiping God and glorifying God. He's, he's showing you how, how Jesus feels about his father, what Jesus is like. But here, Jesus is the high priest. Jesus would come and dwell amongst us. Go to Matthew chapter 1. We'll come back to Nehemiah in a moment. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, 23. Start in verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being, inter which being interpreted is God above us. Is that what it says? God with us. So the very Messiah was going to live right here among us. Go to John chapter 1. Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 10. John 1, 10. Speaking of Jesus, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. You know, most, most every famous person, when they go shopping, you know what they wish? That nobody would recognize them. Well, you know what? The most famous person of the universe came to this world, and nobody recognized him. He came into his own people, verse 11, and his own received him not. Think about that. I mean, what is he doing? He came, he lived, he dwelt among us. Look at verse 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Just stop there. Just he came right into our world. He lived among us. You know, you think about it, he faced the same ruined rubble that we all live in. Jesus, Jesus, born in poverty, uh, faced hunger, was constantly misunderstood, was mocked, was rejected. You ever felt like that? He knows. Because he faced all the rubble that you and I experience. There's no temptation taken to which, which, such as is common to man. And even beyond that, Jesus was tempted in all points such as we were, yet without sin. So you know, you can trust this, he knows how you feel. Amen? Because he's been here. He stepped out. He disrobed that beautiful glory that he had up in heaven. And he stepped down. He took upon him the form of a what? A servant. Jesus came to do the hard things. Now, I find, I find, again, two problems with leadership. Most leaders don't work. And secondly, most leaders don't sweat. But I guarantee you, when Eliashib started picking up rubbish and started moving bold or stuff like that, Eliashib sweat. And the Bible says that when Jesus was doing the hardest work, the most imaginable work, he sweat great drops of blood. He did the hard work. You ever been so overwhelmed that you just wanted to die? And you say, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't live it, I can't keep it, I just, I can't do it. Realize the Lord carried that weight. He came to do the hard work. Aren't you glad for the high priest, Jesus Christ? He came to do the hard work. John 6, 38 says, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. You ever argued with God? Lord, uh, I don't think you're... You're talk, I don't think you're talking to the right guy. Look at John 4.34. You're in John. Just look at a few of these verses. John 4.34. Jesus saith unto them, speaking to his disciples, my meat, my sustenance, my life is to do the will of him that sent me and to what? Finish his work. John 5. John chapter 5, verse 36. 536, 
Jesus still speaking, he says, For I have, but I have greater witness than that of John the Baptist, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish. And believe me, when you think of works, I want you to think of the hard works, the impossible things. He says, The works which the Father hath given to me to finish, the same works that I do. They bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Look at John chapter 9. John 9, verse 4. It was, God bless you, it was the driving force in Jesus' life, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. He couldn't quit while it is day. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Let's see how he ended up. John chapter 17. John 17 and verse 4. Let's see, did he finish the work? He wanted to, he set out to, he endeavored to. Chapter 17, verse 4. 17.4 says, I have glorified thee on the earth. And there's, there's nobody who's glorified God better than Jesus. But he goes on, he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Chapter 19 now, John 19, verse 30. Let's see it sealed. Let's see it settled forever. John 19 and verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, on the cross had received the vinegar, he said, it is. Is, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, the work is finished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. You know, Jesus came to work. When you say, when you say what do you mean by kept the work? He kept the law that you and I can't keep. You know, he went through a field one day and his disciples were taking the, uh, uh, the kernels uh, of corn there and and mushing it into their hands and making a dough, and they were eating it. I used to do that when I was a kid. I used to get our bread, and, and I would take off the crust, and I would take that bread, real soft bread, and I'd fold it over, and I'd fold it over, and I'd fold it over, and fold it over, and I'd mush it down, and it'd become like dough again. You never did that. Oh, it was, and then you eat it, it's like heaven. It was manna from heaven. The point is this. They made a little bit of dough, and they're eating it along the way. Jesus wouldn't even do that. The Pharisee says, they're, they're working on the Sabbath. And he says, no, they're hungry. they got to eat. And so he re revealed that Sabbath wasn't supposed to stop you from eating. But he, he himself wouldn't do that because he wanted to be so perfect in his work to satisfy the requirements of the law. Amen? He did the hard work so that all I have to do is just believe. Amen? Are you glad for a high priest named Jesus? He came to do the hard things. You say, my life is hard. Whatever hard you think, he bore the harder. And he offered himself. Let's go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. In verse 14. Now, Hebrews 4.14 starts here. Look what he says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. His name is not Eliashib here. <laughs> Who is it? That is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Since we have this high priest, let us hold fast our profession, what we believe. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of his grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, this high priest offered himself for our sin. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the apostle Paul proves to the Jews that Jesus is the finished product, the final high priest. And because he's done all that, He's able to repair and restore what sin has destroyed in anybody's life. See, Jesus is not worried if a, if a wall falls down. Jesus is not worried if your car doesn't work. I don't care how many times you lay hands on it. Jesus really doesn't care about your car. I just say, how can you say that? Just follow me for a minute and you'll understand what I'm saying. Jesus really doesn't care about your, um, uh, you know, you being let go of your job. Don't misunderstand me. I'll tell you in a second. I can hear you arguing with me already. Jesus doesn't really care about your, um, uh, your, your personality problems and your looks and all that stuff. You know what he cares about? Fixing things that are eternal, like your soul. 
because if all he was doing was fixing your car and fixing your roofy, uh, your leaky roof, roofy leak, your leaky roof and fixing your, your job opportunities, he's a genie. But we do not serve a genie. We serve a savior. And that savior wants to fix what really matters. And he does all just by, he does it by you getting saved. A lot of people would just say, well, I don't need to get saved. You do need to get saved. You're an absolute, the Bible calls you a fool. I can't call you that, but God does. And says that if you put this thing off, you're missing the only one that can ever fix you, ever save you, ever change your destination. Because you are going to hell whether you like it or not. Unless you're born again. Eliashib started the work and God blessed that and said, I'm going to use that man. I'm going to use him as an example, as a shadow, as a type, as a, as a preview of what Jesus is going to do. And you know, I want you to notice what, go back to Nehemiah chapter 3. I want you to see where they began the work, and we'll finish. I said there are just a couple points here, and we're done. Nehemiah chapter 3, and verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up and his brethren, the priest, and they builded the sheep gate. Now just stop there for a second. The most, the most important gate of that entire, which, which gate would you think? I mean, you know, uh, what gate do you begin with? Well, Eliashib said, we got to fix the sheep gate. Now, Eliashib's the high priest. He's responsible for sacrifices. He's responsible for worship. He's responsible for mediation. He's responsible for making sure that Israel and the people of God are not under the judgment of God, but now have been moved under the forgiveness of God. And the only way to do that is through the blood of an innocent lamb. So the only gate that sheep were allowed to be brought into the city through was the sheep gate. Doesn't that make sense? What's so important about this gate? Well, normally when we think of gates and fortresses, we think of, you know, Big gates that raise up and down, you know, in the modern view of gates. That's a castle gate. This is not a castle. This is a city. So this is actually what the, 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 uh, the sheep gate would look like. It's a door. There's actually two doors that opened up and closed back, all right? The sheep would be brought through this corner gate between two towers. And what was, what was special about this thing was it's directly connected, it was directly behind the temple, where constant worship was going on, constant prayer, constant sacrifices. Now, this gate was really unique because it opened out, and when you went through the gate, it was a straight path to Bethlehem, where the sheep were raised, where the best sheep were raised. That was where Jesus was born, by the way. This gate allowed only shepherds with perfect lambs through. By the way, there were porters there, porters, not reporters, porters who were there who made sure that when the lambs were brought in, they would check the lambs to make sure, is there a spotless lamb? Are there any blemishes? Is the thing hobbling? Does it have a broken leg? Is there a blotch on it? Is there any spot or blemish on this thing? And then they look at the shepherds and make sure, are you a true guy or are you a fraud? Are you coming in here to rob and steal and to destroy? So the porters stood at that gate. They took it very serious. Only shepherds bringing in the best sheep were allowed to come into this gate. Right near behind it was a sheep market where the sheep were all examined and people could come up and they could purchase sheep for their family if they didn't have a good sheep in the home that they brought because everybody was supposed to be bringing their lamb. You know anything about Exodus and the Passover? So they had a sheep market and they would examine the sheep and they would put it up there and says, yes, you can have this lamb and so on and so forth. But what was right behind it was the sheep pool. We don't have time. The sheep pool is the pool of Bethsaida, Bethsaida where a, a lame man, a crippled man, sat for 37 years, 38 years. He sat there waiting for a miracle. He sat at the pool where sheep were washed. And it was said that an angel would come down and stir up the water, and if anybody could get down into that water first, they could be healed. So he sat there hoping, is this true? Hoping maybe I could be there. And he never made it down before somebody else would get into the water. There in, at that little pool, 
Jesus passed by and says, uh, you waiting on something? He says, yeah, I, I want to get down that pool. And he says, you don't need the pool. <laughs> Jesus healed him on the spot. But it was at that pool, right next to the sheep market, right behind the sheep gate next to the temple. So all that stuff coming together here in your Bible, we take for granted. We go, what is this? What is that? There's something wonderful that God was doing when Eliashib says we got to start with this gate. We'll talk about it in a moment. Because it was prophesied to be built first. And I'll read this, and you won't get it, but I'll tell you. Look first in Nehemiah chapter 3 again, verse 1. I'll show you two words here that jump out. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests. They builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it. They set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananel. So there are two towers on the sides of this gate. And then in Jeremiah, Jeremiah made a prophecy. He said, Behold, the days come, in 31, 38, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hanaleel until all the way around to the gate of the corner. And, and what Jeremiah says, that's the gate to start with, at the tower of Hanaleel. I'll tell you what all that means when we go to the conclusion in a second. Before I go any further, I've got to say, there's something that they did to the gate, and that was they sanctified it. When, when, when we say the word sanctification, it means it's prepared for use. So, let's see. Now, if, if um, in the next few weeks, we're going to have some ceramic cups here for tea, okay? So we're, we're moving up from airboard. But can you imagine, here's Tunde here, and he's just giving Dan a cup of coffee there, and Dan sucked it down, he sets it down, and Tunde picks it up, fills it up with some more water, and hands it over to Bill. It's okay. <laughs> it's not okay. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? It's not ready for Bill to use now, is it? Sanctification means you clean the cup out, Amen. You wash it, you sterilize it. You, you, <laughs> you really clean it so the next person... So, and sanctification is that it's prepared for use. So when they got that, that gate fixed, they washed it down, they cleaned it up, they made sure the hinges worked, they made it ready to be used. Again, like I said, it was for the sheep to be brought in. And those sheep were expected to be spotless. And you know what Eliashib said? I want this gate to be spotless. I like that. Now, um, you know, when I got saved on the 15th of June, 1980, I used that date because I want you to know there ought to be a time where you were once lost, but now you're found. But I remember being so forgiven. I, I, I thought I would never sin again. How many were like that? You thought when you got saved, I'm, I'll never sin again. Remember that? Three hours later, you know. But, but the point is this. You are so clean. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from how it's sin. All sin. I remember just how wonderful it was. I, man, it was just, I, I, when I went home and I told my mom that I got saved, I jumped on her bed. I was 17 years old. I hadn't jumped on the beds for at least six months. I, I jumped on her bed and I said, Mom, you'll never believe what happened. I was so excited, so full of life. I was so Thrilled to be saved. You know, I never want to get over that. I never want to get over that. And there it was. Listen, now that my soul is clean, you know what I said? I kind of want to look clean. Not that my cleanliness on the outside does anything for the inside, but you know what? Something happened on the inside. I like it to show. I don't want to go around looking like I'm mad at everybody. I don't want to look like I want to shoot everybody. <laughs> I don't want to, I mean, I'm a Texan, but I don't want to look like a Texan. Uh, I don't want to go around looking like I'm still in the same old Joe. I want to be a new creature in Christ, amen? And this gate was so important to Eliashib, he says, we got to clean this up. They had put those stones back up there, and they washed it down, and they made sure those doors opened and closed. They made sure, listen, the, fo purpose is, the, the, the focus is this. Make sure that if God saved you, you want your life to reflect it. I mean, the stuff that you watch on television, does that reflect Christ? Stuff coming out of your mouth, does that reflect Jesus Christ? That's what sanctification means. Sanctification is not salvation. 
Salvation is by the blood of the Lamb, amen? But the gate ought to look clean, amen? So he cleaned the gate. Took away all the rubbish, washed down the walls and the, 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 the stones, and he made it beautiful. So in reality, this, this gate here was not just restored in its place and pretty, but it was ready to be used. And there's, mm, Sean, some people are sitting in church like this going, I'm not ready. You've been saved 47 years. I, I, I'm not ready. I'm not. No, man. You know, the moment you got saved, God started getting you ready to be used. And stop that. When, when, um, uh, when the Lord touched your heart and says, I need you for this, or when the pastor taps you on the shoulder, I need you for this, make sure you're ready. Don't keep putting it off and saying, oh, I can't, I can't. I know, maybe you can't, but you ought to be getting ready. Amen? Because when they finish those doors, they want them to be used. And when God saved you, he wanted you to be used of him. He wanted you to be available to serve and to bless and to help somebody and to tell them the wonderful story of Jesus and to lead them to faith in Christ and to show them how to read the Bible. You know, a lot of people don't know which way is up. I didn't. Growing up in an atheist home, the only Bible we had was a big family Bible. The only thing I ever did was look at the pictures as a kid. Never read the Bible. So when I sat in church about two-thirds of the way back, right about over there, and I sat there, and the pastor opened the Bible, I had no idea where to turn. They need a Christian to go, I guess that's my cue. <laughs> Let me show you where he's reading. Amen. God saved you to be used, so make sure you're usable. You imagine if you sat down next to somebody, a new visitor in church, you went, here, let me show you in the Bible, and it's got filled with smoke on your breath. Sorry, I hope I brushed my teeth earlier. I did. What am I saying? Man. Are you ready for use? Sounds like a Christian ought to live, amen? Look at your Bible. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. 2 Timothy 2.21 says this. Speaking of a, a Christian, now look, go back to verse uh, 19, 2.19. Second Timothy 2.19, nevertheless the foundation, oh, that's a good building term. Nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And if you're saved, the Lord knows you're saved, and you ought to know you're saved. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Get out from iniquity, man. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, vessels being cups and basins and things. There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but there are also vessels of wood and of earth. Some to honor, like a, like a bowl or a cup, and some to dishonor, like a toilet. If a man therefore purge himself from these, from dishonorable things, he shall then be a vessel unto what? And sanctified. Sanctified means flush stuff out, you dump stuff, you say, I'm not watching that, I'm not going with that, friend, I'm walking away. You say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. If you're saved, you can walk away. Sanctified and meet, we'd say prepared for the master's use. Fitting for the master's use, prepared under every good work. That gate is an example of how we should live. Now, Eliashib did not rebuild the entire wall. Back there, and I won't take you through it, but it says in verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, for the rest of the chapter, it lists, it goes on, and it says 38 individual workers are named in this chapter. Everyone had to get involved. So it actually names 38 different people who are working on this three-kilometer-long wall. 42 different people groups are identified besides the many workers that Nehemiah didn't name because their labors were important. A lot of people were involved. But one guy got it started. What was his name? Listen, the only reason why I'm here today is not because of Eliashib, but because Jesus Christ started a work in my life. I'm only saved because he started it. Amen? 
He started the work. Here's your conclusion. Let Christ do a good work in you. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Back to the left. Philippians 1, 6. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a... I like those words. A good work in you. He began a good work in you. will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, the most important decision you need to make right now is let him work. Let him work. I give you the example. I'll probably use it 200 more times before I die. But I had, I had pain in my abdomen. I thought it was indigestion. So I was taking Rennie's all day long. Nothing would fix. I tried to lay down. Nothing would go away. I ended up at 1130 at night in the hospital. I walked in like this. I said, help. <laughs> I couldn't sit up. And they put me out on the, on the table there, and the guy starts feeling around. He says, Mr. Ledbetter, we got to operate. I said, who's doing the operation? And then comes this 24-year-old doctor, barely out of nappies. He says, Mr. Ledbetter, don't mind my high voice. No, he didn't do that. But anyway, I grabbed, I literally did. I grabbed, I said, have you ever done this before? He says, yeah, I've done about a dozen. I said, oh, so that makes me number 13. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, he says, you're just going to have to trust me. There's nobody else here on staff, on, on call tonight. I'll, I'll have to remove that appendix. You know what? I had a choice. Either die on that table or trust that, that young kid doctor. And I was, not, I was only 18. He was just five years older than me. Would you trust somebody just five years older than you opening you up? My point is this. I had to let him work. I, could, I had tried all the Tums. Uh, Rennie's same thing. Uh, I, had, I had hoped and I had prayed. I laid hands on it. You know. Nothing was fixing. I had to stop. You know, a lot of people, they're praying. They're going to church. They're, 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 they're trying to read their Bible. They're trying to be good, and they're failing. You know, life is a mess. Their marriage is a mess. Their, their mind is a mess. Society is a mess. You know what? We need to let God do a work now. That's what revival is. Revival is not us. It's God doing the work. We need to yearn, God, whatever you ask me to do, I'll let you do it. Whatever you need to do in me, I'll let you do it. Let Christ do a good work in you. You know, whether you realize it or not, he's already been at work. If you're breathing today, he's been keeping you alive. Car accidents. I mean, how many people are alive from overdoses? I mean, it goes on and on. It's because he's already been working. He's not waiting for you to get right either. He's waiting to save you so that you can be right. Eliashib's name means God will restore. You know what Jesus' name means? Jehovah saves. I don't want to just be restored. I want to be saved. Now, I got saved 37 years ago, never looked back. Thank God. Thank God. Because Jesus is a finisher of whatever he starts. You see, I'm not trying to stay saved. I'm not trying to get to heaven. He's going to get me there. He made me right with God, and he keeps me right. Now, I may not look like it all the time, but he's the finisher of the work, amen? Thank God for that. You could just sit down, lay your head down in prayer, and go, Lord, thank you for taking care of me, and I know you'll keep it up. Jesus is a living example of what we should all be doing. He's always, you know what he's doing when somebody's fighting and angry and, and wanting to destroy you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to pull us back, isn't he? He's trying to, now don't do that. Now don't say that lead better. Now, you don't mean that. <laughs> no, he's my example I should be following, not my own heart. So if I ever want to know how far away I am from God, I look at my life, not my wife's, not my kids, not my pastor, not, not anybody else. I look at my life and I compare it with Jesus and I go, I am ashamed. You're my example, Lord. You took it on the cross. You took it when he spit at you. <clears throat> you forgave those who didn't even ask to be forgiven. More than that, Jesus is the only mediator between people and God. We already read it there. I think we did. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Let's do it. 1 Timothy to the right. 1 Timothy 2, 5. First Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and how many mediators? And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You know, he's praying for you constantly. 
The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. You know, he'll never die. And right now, you're on his heart. Your name, I, I don't understand it. He's God, so he can do it. And he, like our faithful high priest, he never forgets me. He's praying for me. He's interceding, and he's keeping me saved. He's a mediator. And you know, only he can bring you and God together. You ever try, you know, Lord, you know, I'll do a deal with you, God. Don't you do that, because God doesn't do deals. You know what he does? He judges. So instead of judging you, he judged his son so that you could come in. Don't try to do a deal. Just trust Jesus Christ. Jesus made several personal sacrifices. You know what he did? He sacrificed his position as God and became a man. He stepped down. He sacrificed his time. You know, I think, I think it, it must have been the, the hardest thing for Jesus to wait as a man. I mean, he had to walk everywhere when he could have been there instantly. You understand what I'm saying? He sacrificed his time. When somebody bothers me and they're taking my time, last night I was with uh, uh, Connor and, and Con uh, Chloe and John and Ruth were over, and Connor comes up to me, and I, my Saturday evenings are pretty blocked. I have to work through this stuff, get the PowerPoint ready and everything. Here comes Connor, and he comes up and says, what you doing, Grandpa? Oh, my heart sinks. I, I, what I have to do. He says, what's that? I said, I got to get a lot of people right with God. He went, wow. <laughs> I said, it's tough. He went, well, you want to read to me? I went, oh. And Chloe comes in with this big ball. She goes, whoa. <laughs> and I go, no. You know, it takes a personal sacrifice, serve the Lord. Now, they understood, and I made up. I'll make up for it this afternoon and stuff. You know, the Lord sacrificed everything because he loves you and me. Jesus made a lot of personal sacrifices, sacrificed his time, but he sacrificed his life <clears throat> once and for all. And the work in us must begin, now this is, and I want to finish up with this thought, at the sheep gate. Now the sheep gate is where the lamb is brought in, and the lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, needs to come through your sheep gate, if I can be so figurative, which is your heart. God designed you for him. God did not design you for hell. God did not design you for the pub. God did not design you for, for 80 hours a week of work. God did not design you just for you to die. He designed you for him, but the only way for you to be forgiven, for you to be restored, is for you to get that lamb in your life. The lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And the sheep gate is your heart. And until you decide I've got to open it up. Go to Revelation chapter 3, and I'll show you an example verse. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. We read chapter 1 of John. It says, He came into his own, and his own received him not. They wouldn't welcome him. They didn't want him. But to as many as received him, opened the door and let him in. It says, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Here's Revelation 3.20. It says, behold, Jesus says, I stand at the what? There are two doors on that gate. If any man hear, and I knock. I don't barge it down. I don't break it down. I don't force my way in. He says, I knock. And if any man just hears my voice and opens the door, what will he say? What does he do? I'll come in. So, you, 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 um, you and me, the most important thing you can do is to not ask God to start working on your wife. <laughs> How many of you gentlemen no, don't, have ever prayed that, you know? Don't ask God to start working on your husband. Don't ask him to work on your money problems or your health problems. And there's no, no problem with praying for all of that. But if you're thinking that that's where God has to start, you're sadly mistaken. He's got to start in your heart. You need to open that door and say, I need a perfect lamb. I need the shepherd to bring the perfect lamb, which was himself, into my heart and save me. And Christian, from that moment, you can sanctify whatever God is repairing. Whatever past, you know, your past could be so beautiful if you let God fix it. You're not going to go back there and make it non-existent. 
but he'll make it beautiful. He'll make it so that your past was not a waste. Make it so that all your stupidity was not for nothing, but he'll make it for good. Amen? He'll take your life. You say, I'm so, I'm so stupid. I'm so foolish. I don't know how to do this. I don't know that. Just say, Lord, would you fix me? And the Lord says, yeah, I will. I want to make something beautiful out of you. Father, I bow right now to your people, and I ask that in the very same way that all the people looked up to Eliashib and got motivated, motivated by Eliashib, start rebuilding that ancient wall 2,400 years ago. We would look unto Jesus and see that something much more important has been sought to be rebuilt. <clears throat> and the first thing's got to be rebuilt is that sheep gate, the gate back to God. And what's funny is we think that we have to do so much stuff when really we don't. Jesus, the high priest, has already built the gate if only we would just open the door and let him in. He's already been working on hearts this morning, God. People have come, not by accident. Everybody who's here is here for one reason. That was to hear this message and make a decision. And I pray that there would be plenty of decisions. Decisions that would say, Lord, I've been fighting you a long time. I've lived amongst the rubble. I have lived content with who I am, and I'm sick of me. So is my wife, so are my kids, so is my boss, and I'm sorry. I can't fix me, so I need you. And I believe that you died for the likes of me, and you want to start over with me. You want to born me all over again, but this time on the inside. And so I yield to you now. I believe you with all my heart that you died and were buried and rose again. And I have decided to follow you. Christian, why don't you make that salvation event in your life something beautiful, never taint it with a bad testimony. Keep it clean. Keep that gate always right between you and God. Keep the rubbish out of the way. Never let anything come between you and your Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.